Um, I have uh, just two things. I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview um, of what Panassis is, then I'm going to talk about uh, application of um, high performance NAS for Hadoop. So if I were to summarize our technical differentiation, it's a, we have a scalable uh, approach to performance. We have a balanced building block. It's a, it's a little storage blade. You can see one over in the room right over there with a couple high capacity SATA drives, an SSD, Intel processor, memory network, dual uh, redundant network interfaces. And we can scale up to systems that have over um, a thousand of those blades in one storage system. We integrate RAID and the file system together. So we do per file data protection. We don't use traditional block RAID. That gives us automatic declustering and scalable rebuild. We have an integrated distributed system platform that takes care of all the hardware and software in that blade cluster. So it just kind of sits in the corner and takes care of itself. Um, it's in spite of being a cluster uh, with tens and hundreds of computers in it, it has an appliance-like management model. Um, so it's very easy to deploy and maintain. Most, most of the energy is just in um, putting things into the rack. Um, our customers love it. We have um, a lot of customers in seismic data, um, in national labs, uh, financial hedge funds, um, manufacturing, Intel, uh, all the tape, all the Intel chips since 2006 have gone through optical proximity correction using uh, Panassa storage for the models. And uh, we're also standards based. We've, we've done work in OSD, object storage, and uh, PNFS. So we're trying to capture our ideas in standards. This is our blade hardware. It's a 4U chassis, uh, two kinds of blades. Generally 10 of those are storage blades that have two drives um, and the SSD. And then there's a metadata server blade that has a, a faster processor and more memory um, and a private 10 gig NIC. In the back of the chassis, which you can't see, are two power supplies and a battery, so it has an integrated UPS, and there's two network switch cards. So each blade has two NICs that are routed to two different network cards, so you have fully redundant networking, um, and we bond a 10 gig uplink from each of the switch cards, so we have a 20 gigabit uplink, and we do about 1,600 megabytes a second out of that chassis from 20 disk drives. Um, we have a, let's see, there's a, in aggregate, we're gonna end up with lots of our director blades that run uh, metadata services. So we have a coarse grain metadata clustering so we can uh, get more metadata throughput when you have a bigger system. We also, that's also where we run the integrated cluster management that takes care of the system with a, with a redundant, um, voting fault tolerant uh, base that everything else sits on top of. Um, we also run NFS and SIFS gateway services so that if you don't run our file system client or the PNFS client, you can use good old NFS or SIFS. So it's a multi-protocol file system. Um, on the storage blades, we run an object store, OSDFS, um, and that has support for things like snapshots and quota. Um, The way this uh, data path works in this kind of system, uh, we don't have a RAID controller. Instead, what happens when the client does a write, the client computes a little bit of redundant data, and then it transmits the data and the redundant data across the network in parallel to all the storage elements. So that's the basics of the PNFS or direct flow architecture. And by doing data protection on a per file basis, we can push the RAID computation all the way out to the uh, compute nodes, we take just a small number of their cycles and we get scalable RAID. When we do rebuild, the, um, the metadata servers are going to do the rebuild, so we're not using any client resources for a rebuild. And every blade participates in a in data recovery. So as we have a larger storage system, um, it's more and more important to recover quickly. And so you can think of the Panassas blade system as just a parallel rebuild machine. It's also a parallel block allocation machine and a parallel data path. Um, when you uh, do that, you get um, scalable performance. Let's see if that's a, oh yeah. So 
you know, scientifically, you can see that this line is twice as high as that line, and that's a twice as big storage system. This is storage system is twice as big as that one, so it's twice as fast. Okay, so you get this scalable performance. Um, and this shows the rebuild performance. So we're on the x-axis, we have a progressively larger storage system. And then on the y-axis is the rebuild rate. And you can see that increases linearly. Um, and if you, th those are, uh, this is a more current graph uh, that just shows the scalability out to eight blade chassis. The horizontal line in the bottom is the uh, per blade, is the per shelf throughput. So it's just dividing the y coordinate by the number of shelves. And you can see it's, it's linear. So we're getting linear scalability in the system. The uh, write performance is slightly better than the read performance because uh, we can hide from the seek penalty of the drives. Okay, so at scale with many clients accessing the storage system, the storage system can't do perfect prefetching. So there's a little bit of seek penalty. Um, and so you see that in the slight difference in performance at scale. Okay, so that's the quick intro. So um, <coughs> Let's, let's talk about taking a high-performance network storage system and applying it to the Hadoop workload. So traditionally, the Hadoop environment started out in 2002 with um, really cheap computers, a cheap hard drive, and 100 megabit Ethernet. Okay, And then eventually they got around to gigabit Ethernet, and now they're starting to think about higher-speed networking. Um, in contrast, in the HPC space, it's always been about having a balanced set of hardware and having a good network. And so, um, depending on the hardware environment, um, you make different trade-offs. Um, and so, in particular, some of the things that drove the Hadoop model or the Google model of mixing compute and data was a weak um, asymmetric network infrastructure. Um, actually, uh, Dr. Panda gave us a great overview of uh, Hadoop earlier. I'm not going to go through that. Um, and I'll just uh, bash the architecture a little bit instead. Um, so, but if you have a weak network, then it does motivate function shipping. Okay? Send your grep over to a disk that has the patterns and do a local grep. Um, however, if you look at the behavior of the job scheduler, because Hadoop is really two things. It's a job scheduler uh, for the MapReduce apps, and then there's HDFS, the file system. The job scheduler is not always able to put a job next to the data it needs. Okay, Each node has a number of job slots, typically the number of cores. Um, depending on how you carve up your application, you'll chop up the different phases into a different number of jobs. Um, the, the scheduler is going to map those jobs onto the available compute resources, just like in any HPC system. It will try to co-locate the jobs with the data, but that may not be possible. So what you see is that there are remote reads, um, and there are definitely remote writes as it does replication for data protection. Uh, and uh, it's, the standard is triplication, so it's going to make three copies of your data. And all that is wandering through a Java-based stack. Okay. And uh, another thing Dr. Panda set up nicely is, you know, if you sort of bypass that Java I.O. stack and just go more directly to the hardware, it goes faster. Uh, so, you know, in contrast, in the HPC world, we have a, uh, uh, a network-oriented environment. Okay, we're going to put InfiniBand or 10 gig E or 40 gig E in there, and we're going to um, have compute nodes, and we're going to have storage systems. Um, Part of that also re uh, reflects the purchasing cycle. Uh, often the compute node cycle purchases are more quick. Um, maybe every 18 months you're buying a new batch of compute nodes that are the latest technology, but maybe you're only up, you know, buying new storage at a much lower rate, or you tend to hold on to storage systems for longer. Okay? The, um, even if you're buying more storage, you tend to hold on to your old storage for quite a while. Um, the other point I want to make is you guys are doing lots of different things in your HPC um, machine rooms, okay? You're not doing just MapReduce, you're doing MPI, you're doing computational fluid dynamics, you're doing simulations. You have a broad variety of job mixes, okay? So 
if you can figure out how to take your regular old um, HPC environment that you've already invested in and run MapReduce efficiently, then you can get you know, economies of scale and you can share. So the um, the performance intuition of, you know, you know, frankly, of course, I sell storage. So I think really I want you to buy a dedicated high performance storage system. I don't want you to go buy uh, a special compute system just for Hadoop, okay? Um, but I'll, I'll be upfront about that. But there's, a, there, there's two good reasons to do that. There's a performance reason and a management reason. Uh, performance intuition, you know, local disks are kind of slow and crappy. They go maybe 50 megabytes a second, 100 megabytes a second through the file system if you're lucky. Um, if you have a, a 10 gig NIC or an InfiniBand NIC, you can do 500 to a megabytes a second or a gigabyte a second of bandwidth over that high performance NIC to a good storage system. Um, now you could get IO performance by putting an SSD card in your compute node, but you could more than double the cost of that compute node by putting in a, a really good SSD if you're not careful. Okay. The big news from Fusion I.O. was that you can now buy a, a three terabyte SSD and it's only $10,000, okay? But you know, you probably spent that much on your whole node, okay? Um, and as I said also, um, tuning MapReduce turns out uh, to be how you chop the jobs up into little, um, how, how you partition the jobs um, and align with data is, can be as, have as dramatic a impact on performance as anything else too. Um, and then the management intuition, you know, if you're, uh, we have data administrators coming to us and they're sort of terrified of these MapReduce clusters because they, they can just imagine a bunch of important data that's sort of scattered throughout this compute farm um, and they don't really have control over it. Um, and uh, it's, it's hard to do upgrades without affecting that storage and then the serviceability of these nodes is not so good. So if you add a bunch of hard drives to a node, it becomes less reliable, okay? More reasons for it to fail. And if you put that uh, PCIe, expensive PCIe card in a compute node too, that's another reason for it to fail. Um, so it's, it's just harder to manage. Uh, we've, you know, storage systems have grown up uh, all about being easy to take care of. So I have a few, um, Eat this dead horse for a little bit longer. Um, <coughs> let's see. So, um, if you're gonna, I have a the table compares a bunch of aspects of running HDFS or using uh, the Panassas file system. So, for data protection, we use Object RAID. Um, so, we're we have about a 15% capacity overhead. And in Hadoop, you're gonna have a 200% capacity overhead because you're gonna do a three way three way mirror. We, it's a POSIX file system. You can run all sorts of different jobs on it. Okay, it's not uh, in HDFS. It's basically wired into the Hadoop uh, um, environment. And uh, while you can do things like LS, it's not LS. It's HDFS LS. It's just different. Um, you can scale your compute different than your storage. Okay, so. You can buy more compute when you get money for compute, and you can buy more storage when you get money for storage. You don't have to mix those two together. Multi-purpose workloads, I've emphasized that. Um, and also um, <coughs> mixed workloads, okay? So uh, especially with our latest version that has the SSD, we put all the small files and all the block-level metadata on uh, the SSD. And so even if you have a crappy workload, which is a bunch of teeny little files, um, the system does the system does pretty well for that, um, and uh, you know HDFS traditionally has a hard time with small files. Okay, it's oriented towards everything that's a 64 megabyte chunk, and that that may or may not be true depending on your data. Okie dokie. So of course you want reliable, trusted enterprise storage, and uh, the guy from Zyrotex also explained why it's a good idea to have reliable, you know, high performance storage that's built to be storage. Uh, he mentioned vibration, you know, we also worried about that too in our chassis design. Um, and if you just buy a white box server and jam some hard drives in it, um, you might find that uh, the fans are kind of old and crappy and they vibrate and so the disk performance in your chassis goes down, okay? So it's things like that that a compute vendor doesn't think too much about when they, when they stuff it full of disk drives. Um, talked about independent scaling. 
data management, all that stuff. Okay, um, I want to give a couple performance results. So what we did is we did some experiments that just compared running MapReduce against on a compute node using the local drives. We used up to three hard drives because that was easy for us in the computes. We used uh, quads that have 12 disk drives so we could put three disk drives for each, each quad node. Um, and then we compared taking that same number of disk drives and putting it inside a Panassa storage system and we're going to run a benchmark that compares that. And um, it turns out you can do that with no, uh, no work. Okay, you can just configure HDFS to use the NAS as storage. Um, and there's two slightly different ways to do that. Uh, but basically it's just a, a configuration exercise. No, no coding required. Um, and we wrote a little white paper so if you go to the uh, Panassas website you can see exactly what we did. And um, you know, so on the right, the lower better number of course is using our stuff. Um, and we're doing TerraSort and we're running, um, uh, there's three phases of TerraSort. One is generating the data, one is sorting the data, and one is validating the data. So it's sort of a write phase, that's the light blue um, phase at the bottom, a sort phase and a read phase. Now in this case, we're actually layering HDFS over Panassas, okay? And so you can see, for example, that the, uh, the generation phase and the uh, read phase are a little bit slower because we're, we're still doing that Java IO stack and we're still occasionally um, uh, going um, uh, over the network, even in the read path. And also we're um, doing two copies. I think this is actually the, the, two, copy, the two copy thing. So we're even writing two copies to PanFS uh, because um, the HDFS <coughs> fault model is that if a if a data node goes down, it thinks the data's gone, even though that data node is using NAS for storage. Okay, so even writing um, uh, two copies to PanFS, and I'm pretty sure it was three copies on the local disk, were, were faster. Um, no, no, I, so I strike that. It's two copies in both cases, or one copy in both cases. Um, then the other uh, the other experiment, which I like a little better, is. Uh, no HDFS in the picture. Okay, so instead of having an HDFS colon URL for your data set, you have a file colon URL, um, and the file is just mapped onto uh, your PanFS mount point. And in this case, all the bars are smaller. Okay, so the read phase and the write phase are smaller because you're completely bypassing the HDFS stack. Um, and of course, the sort phase is smaller as well. And in this case, we're um, we're doing two copies with HDFS for reliability, and we're just using the built-in object RAID for it with the Panassas. Uh, so we have redundancy in both cases. Um, all right, 